if they're a, a semi-pro or pro athlete, you better believe they're not going to take 10 to 12 weeks. They're probably going to take longer. Why? Because of the amount of stress that they place that body through. And Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the podcast. Uh, welcome all new listeners. And uh, for those of you who've listened to my content in the past, welcome back. Welcome back to uh, the dungeon of uh, chaos and, and all new thoughts for uh, being able to manage your patients, your clients, your professional career. Uh, everything I do is to help you along the journey we call life and, and your professional career. I promise that if you've listened to my podcast in the past, some of you are listening saying like, oh, that's not relevant yet. And maybe another podcast comes on and you're like, oh my gosh, like that hit me today. And some of the topics you'll realize, like it's just where you are along the journey. Some of you are, you know, PT students. Some of you are new grads. Some of you are established or some of you are just generally interested in PT. Uh, I hope this one helps along the way. I uh, I always like to share uh, why I am doing this podcast episode, what what fueled it, uh, what life experience, uh, and then uh, you know what's going on in life and and how that relates to your professional career. So uh, before I go into the podcast, what is what is good with me personally and professionally? Uh, my son had his first picture day. Um, so excited! Uh, we actually put him on a sweater vest, which was amazing. I, w- I watched him get dressed, and uh, he's five years old and and just growing confidence. And um, as a as an educator, as a uh, coach, as a leader, uh, I just love that aspect of like confidence building. And and some would say it's professional development, but it's really like just confidence building. That's you're just getting better, more confident at whatever it is you're trying to do, um, PT or I don't know. Uh, running or weightlifting, whatever it is, you just get more confident. And nonetheless, um, why am I doing this podcast on sacroiliac pain, S-I-J pain, whatever you call it? And I I don't want to get to the nuances of like, does it move? How many centimeters or millimeters? I don't care about that. I'm not trying to do that. Like you can watch Instagram or Facebook or somebody else to to give you all the nuances. Um, I want to bring you into a higher level of the way I manage uh, SIJ pain. And this came up from a conversation that I had this afternoon downstairs with a couple of the clinicians. Uh, I walked into the room and uh, they were going over different scenarios on is this SIJ pain? And uh, But they were having problems with a forward bend. Uh, they were on their back and they did cluster testing and, and not all of them matched. And, you know, I, I love treating SI pain or SIJ pain, whatever it is. I love lumbar, hip, SIJ. Like that is, mm, I love it. I, I I love very very complex cases. I I love simple ones and, and straightforward ones are, are pretty pretty fun. But uh, I grew a passion for SIJ pain, um, just along the way uh, as part of my residency at the Ohio State University. I was treating so many hip pain patients, and the reason why is because. Uh, there was an orthopedic uh, surgeon who, at the time, was becoming a specialist in uh, uh, F, uh, I would say, labral tears more than FI. So when when all this surgeon does is treat labral tears and they do surgery on them by default, I would get them. And so for me, I understood more so than ever that there was trends in people with hip pain. Um, There was like impingement-based symptoms. There was labral-based symptoms. But they usually had sacral iliac problems. I don't know what chicken or the egg was. It didn't matter. They, They would present very similarly. So my job was to help facilitate pre-op and post-op care. And what I realized was if I did a good job, I had nothing to lose on the pre-op. Like, what if I try and get them better faster? Like, what if I could prevent surgery? Like, that was my mindset. And um, I had nothing to lose. So I would, I mean, I would work hard to help these people uh, prevent surgery. But, you know, the majority of them ended up uh, getting surgery. And to me, as a young clinician, it gave me a different view on how SI, hip, low back pain all go together. So, I was working downstairs with the, with the team members, and um, they were navigating a, a case, right? And so we went through a couple different scenarios, and uh, a couple of the things, the tests that I would have done, were in a sequential order, and it, 
it was a different view on how we were going to manage this case. And I wanted to share because I think that there's a lot of people who view, depending on who your circle is and who you follow and, and YouTube and Instagram and what you, your PT school and whatever sets that framework, my passion is helping you see it from a larger perspective because you're going to take content courses wherever you are along your professional career and they're all they're going to tell you okay you should do a grade two mobilization here you should put your hand on this direction you should uh, do inferior mobilizations you can do supine whatever it is and i think that like those things are always going to change little nuances but the way you manage the case is there's fundamentals and you're going to stick to that so i wanted to share what that what the case was and this is going to help you not with replicating this personal case but understanding the framework on how i manage sacroiliac joint pain now for perspective um, we've had people fly in from out of state out of the country whatever it is to get cases like this managed and when you see it from a higher view it's actually pretty easy to manage these cases it's all about where their check boxes hit and where are their commonalities within their symptoms, whatever it may be. And so um, let, let me share. All right. So uh, this case they were managing was right-sided uh, SI pain. And they were getting it with uh, forward flexion. So bending forward. Uh, they were getting it with uh, any form of uh, hip flexion or knee raising. And it became like what cluster of tests would you use and i don't i don't want to dive into like the current research and what, what, what's updated i want to give you an outline of what that looks like so when we talk about uh sacroiliac pain let me give you a simple framework okay and maybe you've heard this a thousand times maybe you've heard it zero times it doesn't matter where you are it might be relevant to how you're processing uh cases so i went with the format of okay so is this an opening or a closing problem? So if they're pain with extension, it's a closing problem. If it's pain with flexion, it's an opening problem or a gapping problem. And it could be ipsilateral or a contralateral, whatever it is. So I think one of the things that I took away from having the discussion is number one, try and do all your tests in standing. Now we're just talking about the diagnostics component of it. You're the, in the evaluation. Try and do as many of the tests in standing as possible. So I like a forward flexion test. Um, if that is positive and that hurts, I'll do a compression-based testing to get force closure on the sacroiliac joint as they, so pushing on that as they go into forward flexion. And what that does for me is it tells me, can I close down and have an impact? And because it involves spinal flexion and sacroiliac uh, flexion, it's, it, it just gives you an idea of which direction to go. Now, if compression, and I'm doing firm compression, I actually put a lot of pressure through uh, my hands to be able to close down that SI joint. And if, that, if they say, oh my goodness, that feels so much better. If it was spinal problems, that wouldn't have impacted their pain. So when you give compression, that's a positive test. Now we know there's potential. Now we got to confirm it. So the next thing before you go supine and you do all of those cluster tests, think about this. Now, all you have to do as they do a standing uh, spinal flexion test, prop one leg onto a like a six inch step. So one leg is, is on a step, the other one is not, and have them go into forward flexion. Now you have one knee up, which is putting them in a more gapping. So on the knee up, if that causes more pain, you know it's a con it's a consistent opening problem. And by you gapping, or excuse me, with you compressing, that was also going to be uh, uh, a positive test for an opening problem. So I don't want to get down the, the rabbit hole of like, you know, open, close, have millimeters, whatever it may be. I'm talking about making your life simple. In standing, if they have pain, add compression. If that feels better, prop that same leg up onto a six inch step, have them go forward. If that is po if that's painful, that's another positive for an opening. Now, if you put it on the opposite leg and you, they go down and it is not painful, we're down, we're doing great. We're figuring out exactly what they need. And now before you've even put them on to sit down and do all the cluster tests, you already know where, to, where you're thinking. This is a problem with 
an opening. It's opening too far. It hurts in gapping or hurts an opening. So next, put them in sitting. And when you put them in sitting, just have them do seated hip flexion. If seated hip flexion on the same side hurts, it's an opening problem. It's the same thing. Now you've eliminated the spinal flexion. Do the opposite side and that probably won't hurt. And if you want, go fancy. Do a uh, uh, slump test. And if you do a slump test, yes, we're, I understand you're biasing the nerve, but all you're doing is you're adding spinal flexion with load and creating opening on the same side. So if a slump test with the right leg extending hurts, you're confirming it's a, it's a gapping problem, opening problem. And guess what? Probably the left will be a negative. So what I'm saying is, if you had them in standing and it was painful, you provided compression, that felt better, you propped their right leg up on a six inch step, had them bend forward, and that hurt, were an opening problem on that right. Confirm that with sit down, seated hip flexion, seated hip flexion helped, or excuse me, hurt. Now we, we're confirming this is a opening based problem. Before you even had to go supine, you already know where you're going. You can do the supine like stabilization test, straight leg raise, all those other things. But and, and why is this relevant? Here's why. Because I the way we describe it is when we're working with, with clients here at Sports Performance, uh, it's like flipping a burger. Uh, you don't want to flip it too many times. You burn it, right? Like where all the juice and, and it's not as delicious. You want to minimize how many times you flip. So when we work with clients, it's the same. Yeah, and we, we put PTs through interviews here and what we realize is they flip too much on that initial evaluation. You're like, if you have somebody in pain, the last thing you want to do is stop moving them. And it's only because your sequence of uh, diagnostics is off. It could be a little bit more efficient. Do as much as you can in standing, then do as much as you can in sitting, and then put them on their back. You're only going to flip them once. Do as much as you can in supine. Do as much as you can. Then put them prone. Then bring them back up to sitting or standing cuss or whatever it is you want to be. But what I'm saying is don't flip the burger too many times. That's key. It's critical because if you're in pain, the last thing you want to do is keep moving and running through all these tests that are aggravating you in the first place. So tip number one for sacroiliac pain. Make sure you do all as many tests as possible in the positions that they're in standing then sitting supine prone and stop flipping them. I see it all the time, especially new grads or those where you see a complicated case. You could be out five to six years out of PT school and you just get this complicated case and you're like, I have no idea what this is doing. Well, let me see. I Oh, I forgot that test. Let me try this test. Let me try this one. What you're failing to realize is what it feels like to be in pain. Stop moving me. <laughs> so try and minimize how many times that you flip the burger. All right. Uh, number two, once you have that diagnostics, uh, we talk about plans of care here. So um, one tricky part was, uh, the, the, and let me preface this, how you manage your patients and clients is based on the population you serve. Let me get that fully clear because a lot of you will be in a orthopedic style clinic or maybe you work in a high level sports activity center or maybe you work pro sports, but depending on who you see in that spectrum, I'm talking about servicing people who want to be in a high level activity. And that could be community members, it could be pro athletes, it doesn't matter. The people we serve are those who are training four to five days a week, maybe six. If we're working with pro athletes, they're training seven. If you're training a community member and they work out one day a week, guess what? It's probably going to be easier for you to get that patient pain-free faster. Why? Because the level of trauma that they have to endure and that they manage during the week is very low. So it's easier to fix that pain. Now, when you start working in the spectrum of people who work out four, five, six days a week and with heavy load and high intensity, it's harder to manage their pain. So results are even more important to, to uh, improve but with a structure and a system because there's more variables to tackle. Now, why is that relevant? Because as PTs, what we hope to achieve is pain-free living, right? Like this all mighty, uh, you know, no one's going to have pain ever in this world, which is completely false. All we're trying to do is mitigate pain 
while people destroy their body. That's all we do. Try and mitigate the pain because they're going to do it. But that's the people we serve. So just a caveat for those new listeners, I'm talking about a different audience. For those who've been with me for a while, you understand the people I'm talking about are the, the people like you. They're going to work out no matter what. And you're just trying to figure out ways to reduce their pain and give them better forecasts and projections so they listen to you and help you along the way. Okay? So, all right. Now, a plan of care. So, for some of us, um, it might be set by Dr. Google. They went to, to Google or uh, maybe their physician or whatever it may be. But I'm obsessed with timelines. Like, I lo- I'm obsessed with timelines. I think that if you can get the timeline right, that's when you know you're really good at your craft. And what that means is if somebody comes to you with sacroiliac pain and it's an opening problem and you know the whole history, the next question is, well, now what? How long is this going to take? And what do I need to do in between? And then what can and can't, what can and can't I do in working out? We call them our, the do's and the don'ts, the green, yellow, and red lights. So if you have people who are... Uh, um, having this pain, you kind of have to break them up into two different components, traumatic and atraumatic. Both are going to be very similar, but the way you manage them are going to be just a little different. So the case that we were talking about today was a traumatic SIJ pain from falling on an object. Uh, they rolled and uh, ended up hitting their SIJ uh, on the on an edge of a box or something. And they are late 30s, early 40s, traumatic, pinpoint, PSIS, SIJ pain with lumbar flexion, any type of ipsilateral knee flexion or hip flexion, uh, knee to chest, those type of things. So what that tells you is it's an opium-based problem, and it's confirmed with all the tests that we just talked about. So now, once you know all that, guess what? Let's see how good you are at your craft. How long is this going to take to heal? What can and can I do? And then I'd like to know if it doesn't get achieved by then, what's the long term? When do I start looking at imaging? And I think it's important as a provider that you're able to at least intuitively know these things. Why? Because it sets your expectations of what success looks like. And if you struggle with this, this is an important part of being a true sports physical therapist. All right. So let me let me show you and and tell you how this went. We have traumatic SIJ pain, and the person was starting to look at, well, do I need an MRI? And I asked the clinician, do they need one? And they said, no, I, I think that we can manage them. But the problem is it's after 12 weeks. I told them 12 weeks, and now they're concerned. Oh, I see. So in any ligamentous sprain, you would imagine a high grade, you're going out 10 to 12 weeks in anything. It, it, what's a... Uh, deltoid ligament, ATFL, whatever it is, at a high grade, you're probably looking at 10 to 12 weeks for like 90% recovery. Now, let's treat the SI. If if there was, it's an opium-based problem, let's assume ligamentous. I mean, otherwise, why, why are you getting so much motion? So if that's the case, the preface should have been 10 to 12 weeks to get you the 90% mark. However, the type of people you serve will dictate also what type of bumpers you have to control for this person. If they're a, a semi-pro or pro athlete, you better believe they're not going to take 10 to 12 weeks. They're probably going to take longer. Why? Because of the amount of stress that they place that body through. And if they have to go larger stress, high intensity, higher workload, higher volume, higher load, all those variables are now going to increase how long it's going to take for them to fully recover. But here's the thing. If you don't tell them that, you set yourself up for failure. And why is that important? Because they need to understand what normal and not so normal feels like or what it will be like. So when you treat people who are very athletic and they refuse, they're not going to stop, right? So in this case, this person was having pain with full squatting because they had a butt wink. So if they have a posterior pelvic tilt, that's an opening problem. So they were still back squatting full depth. Well, what does that do? It contributes to their pain. Well, if and and you have high load and high intensity, it's only going to delay it. So I said, 
what I would have done from the very beginning. If this is a high grade sprain and uh, they're having SIJ pain because of contact, it was high trauma, they're limping, and they're very athletic. They're on the far side of that bell curve. If you ever held, uh, heard my, my spiel on the right side of the bell curve, and those are the very athletic people, this is also going to have potential to last longer. So what I would have said is, under normal circumstances, without a lot of stress, you should be feeling 90% better in 10 to 12 weeks. However, given your workload, and if you continue to stress this thing, and you add load, add, add volume, add intensity, and you're still training five to six days a week, and you're not compliant with your home exercise program, it's going to double the length. It puts you at four to six months. So what you did was you put bumpers. If you're going to listen to me, you're going to do 12 weeks. And if you're not going to listen to me, it's probably going to be about six months. Which one do you want? And somewhere along the way, you'll know that. But what happened is this person hit 12 weeks and they're like, I should be cured. Why am I not? Ah, I see. The bumper should have been placed at the very beginning. And what that allows them to do is plan and forecast and understand they have a role in the recovery. It's everything that we talk about as a profession, but yet we can't implement and provide that feedback. Why? Because we're not even confident in it in ourselves, yet we want the autonomy to be able to help people but we need to be able to get set those plans. And for some of us, that's fearful because we've never seen it. And I think the, the more honest and transparent you can be with your patients and clients, the more they can understand you, you're literally trying to do the best for them and you have to give them guidelines. And like best case scenario, worst case scenario, and somewhere in there will probably be you, depending on how much you, your work you put in, how much stress you allow, if you continue working out, if you don't listen to me, I mean, all those things. And the best patients and clients and, and those are the people we serve. Those clients and patients will appreciate that. So um, on the assessment side, I gave some clinical pearls. Make sure you organize them accordingly. Don't flip the patty too much. On the uh, assessment and plan of care side, when you're setting that and you're telling people genuinely, is this going to take you about three months to heal? That's hard for people to hear, but it's honest. And you got to have that conversation. And then if not, then if you know it's going to be four to six weeks or four to six months, tell them that. They need to know. And instead of now this person's asking, do I need an MRI? Do I need an x-ray? Do I need a CAT scan? What do I need to get this diagnostics done? And they're about 50, 60% better. It's because they're just doing so much more high intensity afterwards and they're not letting it heal. So do we think that they need the imaging? Absolutely not. But it might help them justify what is really going on. And so that could have been beat with a front conversation of actually the double the length if you're not going to listen, which is where this person is at. So the way I would manage SIJ pain is um, I am very firm on my compression testing to make sure that this thing is true SIJ pain um, and not lumbar. And I like to do a lot of seated tests to make sure that I get less and less influence versus standing tests. Um, set the plan of care with very, very strict guidelines and good bumpers so that they have an awareness of it. Also, when you talk about SIJ pain, right, and this is an opening-based problem, what are things that you should not allow them to do? So obviously, full flexion, <laughs> uh, full squats, uh, I wouldn't do because that's an opening-based problem with a posterior pelvic tilt. A big thing that people miss is the lack of stability or opening and closing that most patients and clients don't even know exist when they go on throughout their normal day. So one of the things I realize is people will do stairs and they don't like that. They don't like the, the ipsilateral movement or opening of that same side. So if they're having pain going up the stairs with that right leg for a day or two until I can keep it calm, yes, I'll let them do just uh, ascending with the left. The second piece is increasing their strides. So like if they're a fast walker and they have long strides, you're opening and closing that pelvis at a longer pace. So I would shorten the strides. Easy thing that you can do. What that allows them to do is have less motion across. Secondly, I would also discourage them from doing high or loaded ipsilateral movement where it requires that you have uh, that pelvis opening and closing at a large scale. So lunges, that would be a big piece to avoid. All that is going to do is continue to irritate and delay the healing. 
I'm not saying they're going to fix them 100%. As I, man as I mentioned, you don't need to be fixed on the granular mini components of the mobilization that is going to f help them feel better for 48 hours. That is small relative to the grand scheme of fix them, fixing somebody for the long term. Those things are great to kickstart them and, and get them on the right path. But the problem is if you don't know what the path looks like, you're just going to be playing this like at session four. You're like, I don't know what to do with you anymore. I don't. I, I, I thought I got you better at one. You said we were 20% better, 40% better, and then your symptoms came back. Why? Because you're not fixing the outside components of it. Stop letting them lunge. No more single leg RDLs, high step ups, no full depth squats. All those things allow them to do that. Anything pulling from the ground, deadlifts, if they do uh, Olympic weightlifting, pulling from the ground is only going to increase that irritation. So if they have to, they got to pick it up from a higher surface. It doesn't matter. Stop allowing them to get full opening across the sacral iliac joint. So no pulling from the ground. Use dumbbells, kettlebells. That way barbell, it's it's a longer path, so they have to flex so much more. So reduce those stimuli. Now, uh, what about, if you guys know my framework, you know I'm going to go to what about taping and bracing. What do I do for this person? Guess what? I'm going to tape and brace them because you know why? If you come to see me, or when you come to see me, yes, you're a physical therapist, and we all need help. If your parents, your sister, your sibling, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your whoever comes to see us, see me, I'm going to treat them as if it was my body, or my fan, my friends, my family, it doesn't matter. I'm going to treat them the same way. And when you're in pain, you, you want somebody to fix that. So I'm not looking at, like, uh, this research article said it was only 20% improvement with taping. I'm talking about how do I get this person better faster so they can get back to doing anything that they want to, just as if I would expect that. So now, as I mentioned, I'm not treating like the orthopedic, I only exercise once or twice a week type of a patient or client. I'm treating the person who trains five, six, seven days a week. And some people have income that is based on their body. So my commitment to them has to be accordingly. I can't treat somebody who trains one or two days a week the same as five, six, seven. As a person, I will. I'll treat them the exact same, give them the utmost respect and high integrity. However, the way I treat them and the type of modalities, the type of things that I do are going to be very different. Some people will say, well, why don't you just give them exercise and they can fix themselves? It's not going to happen. They're not going to do it by themselves. These people need so much more. So you better believe I'm going to fix those outside variables. First, I got to set that plan of care, make sure that they know what the expectations are. Next, I'm going to give them their bumpers, tell them what they can and can't do uh, during training, outside of training, whatever it is. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to tape and brace them 100%. Why? Because if it was my back, I better be getting something to help me support because I can't walk or I can't flex. I can't do whatever it is. So uh, one of the things I'll do is I'll uh, I'll add in a uh, sacroiliac belt, and I don't have a brand. You do whatever you want. I, I, I think the one I've ordered in the past is like Sorola, S E R. O L A and no, I have no financial uh, commitment to them. Um, so th uh, what I'll do is I'll provide that support and uh, and all that allows them to do is have that compression and provide temporary relief. Now the word there is temporary. So uh, I'll allow them to wear it during uh, all waking hours uh, and usually for the first 72 hours, hands down, and then for sure over the next two weeks. So I can get over that first soft tissue healing phase. If you guys know my process with soft tissue healing, first uh, three days, you know, if they're believers in meds and they need that, great, go go for them. Uh, and then if they, if the belt helps within those first three days, you better believe I'm going to go two weeks. After those two weeks, I'll start to wean them off so I can just develop uh, the form closure and just get uh, strength on top of that. But you have to understand, I'm using things in phases, not as a permanent component. So yes, I'll use tape. Yes, I'll use bracing, one, to get them to a certain phase until they can get strong enough and manage that independently while I control for all the bumpers. I've already set the plan of care. I understand how long that's going to take. When you put this in place, this person is going along this guided path and they're like, man, this is amazing. This person knows what they're doing. So when you're managing sacroiliac pain, one of the biggest things that I, I want you to take away from this is that you have to control for the outside variables. If you assume that your exercise and your corrective exercise, your four exercise or 10 exercises that you're going to give them are going to fix them, that's very difficult 
with these people because they don't know the things that are aggravating them. You have to separate it into, is it a for, is it an opening problem? Is it a closing problem? And apply that to their entire day. Listen, when you sit down and you slump, that also hurts. When you stand on one leg and you rotate to pick up your kids, that's also opening. So you have to put it in context, in like layman's context. You have to help them understand how they are going to make their pain worse. Once you do that, you can eliminate your, your how dependent they become on your treatment and your plan is the most important, but they have to understand. It's all about you package this. And if you ask me, why do you love sacroiliac pain? Because I love managing the outside variables, and that is where a lot of the success comes from. Yeah, I am all about manual therapy. If you ever watch my videos on, on Instagram or YouTube, wherever it is, I love manual therapy. I love everything about it. Yes, I want to get my hands on them. I want to fix everything. However, if you don't have the outside variables, you will just be another clinician that they saw. I promise you, most of these people have been to massage, you didn't fix them. They went to a chiropractor, it didn't fix them. They went to acupuncture, didn't fix them. Why? Because it's a it's a movement-based problem that is like too loosey-goosey or whatever your analogy is. And they need that component. That's what they're looking for when they come to see you. So it's like, I've tried all these things. Why isn't this coming together? It's because you couldn't put the whole package together. It's because you continue to, you know, uh, open that joint. You continue to load at the very base of a squat. You continue to add in single leg RDLs. We need to reduce those things. I'm going to brace you right now. I'm going to tape you. I'm going to do this manual therapy. But while you're at home for the next three days, don't do these four movements. Then what I need you to do is I need you to come back. We're going to, you know, reevaluate your posture, see where things are. If you continue to have symptoms, continue eliminating those things, decrease your load. Yes, you can train three days a week, but you're going to have to decrease your stride when you run or walk. Just understand, when you put it in context of how they're making it worse, they feel empowered because they now know how to control their symptoms. And that's everything we preach as a profession, making people you know, independent and they know exactly what it is. But the problem is, you assume you're telling them one time fixes the problem. That won't happen. You got you got to tell them every single session as if it's a, the first time they ever seen you, and don't get frustrated. It's because they have chaos in their life, and this is the last thing they want to think about. And they're coming to you for solutions, so don't get frustrated. Have patience with these people. It's like a dentist telling you, "Hey, d uh, did you floss again?" You're like, "Oh, you told me that last time. I didn't do it." Guess what? Let's do it again. <laughs> so I want you to do these five things until I see you next time. These are your next uh, few uh, homework assignments. So. Those are clinical pearls with SIJ pain. I mean, we can go forever. Like I, I literally can do a whole course on SIJ pain. But I need you to understand wherever you are as a new grad or PT student or, or established you know, PT, whatever you are, put these clinical pearls back into your mix. Don't forget. Stop thinking it's about the SIJ movement and everything else and only exercise will fix it or only taping will fix it. It doesn't matter. Use them when they are appropriate in the grand scheme of this person. And don't be afraid that other, your your friends who are therapeutic exercise gurus or this person who think you're, they're a manual person that you're going to be judged by anybody. It doesn't matter. Don't make it about your colleagues. Don't make it about you and your patients because it's the right thing to do. Sometimes you have to like filter out all the other people because it's about what's doing right. It's, it's about what's doing the right thing for the person in front of you as if it was your parent. And I, I, I bet you if it was your aunt, your uncle, your brother, your sister, you would treat them in an ideal fashion. Yet that changes when it's a different person who is going in through health insurance or paying you out of pocket, whatever it is. Like, why does that change anything? You should treat them as if they were your family member. And so these type of things are the, th the considerations that you need. So to summarize on the assessment, stop flipping the burger so much. Number two. Provide the bumpers of what they can and can't do. Three, set that plan of care so they know exactly what that roadmap looks like. Three months, worst, canario, worst case scenario, four to six months, but that's because of you, you don't want to listen. Once they understand that, you reiterate every single component, every single session. And what that does is friendly reminders. Don't assume that they don't care about their their care and that's why they just have chaos in their life don't like feel like don't 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 feel get your feelings hurt because they don't listen to everything that you said it's like this is just a small spectrum in their whole week and they're literally just trying to do this so they can go do group exercise at orange theory f45 
CrossFit. It doesn't matter. Get them on that path and, and that don't stop feeling, you know, like uh, you have to conquer the world. You just need to get them to another week, week by week by week. And uh, that'll help save uh, your professional development and understand that you are going to grow as a clinician, not just because of the skill set that you do, but more of a greater understanding of how you're doing it and why people listen to you and how you get them better so much faster. It's not because of the skill set. Like, it's not that your mobilization's got that much better. It's your framework that set you up for success. Now you got it. You were like, now I know the mobilizations to do, and I know which bumpers to put on, and I know the right plan of care, and I came in confident. That person's going to get better in five weeks and they're going to listen to me and it was everything that went into that professional development it wasn't just the con ed course that you took on the si pain it was everything that you've developed to that so i said at the beginning of the podcast it's not just about the nuances of grade two supine uh, p to a medial lateral it, I, don't, I don't care about that you can do whatever you want i'm just saying set the framework to set you up for success. And those are the little things that will make the difference on people who think the world of you or you are just another clinician to them. So I hope that helps uh, set your framework. I'm obsessed with that. And uh, in, in understanding in the grand scheme how you can improve it and not just get like lost in the nuances of the treatment aspect of it. And uh, treat them like a person. Think about what their week looks like. Think about what their month looks like. And if they were your family member, how would you change that treatment? Just food for thought. All right, guys. I'm out to uh, work out with my wife and uh, go to happy hour. All right. Uh, enjoy your weekend. I will talk to you guys on the next episode. Take care.